Hello and welcome to another episode of Factor Film. Today we're going to be looking at Ender's Game. Uh, the movie was okay, it wasn't all that great, however the book was rather quite good. Um, in this video we'll be talking about the film and not the book, but you know, still worth recognizing that it was a good book. It's been quite some time since my last video and just like to say, in university, still studying, don't have a lot of time, so make them when I can, and here it is. I've also decided that my last videos, the intros were far too long, so without any further ado, here is Ender's Game. The International Fleet uses a device called an Ansible to communicate over extremely long distances without the expected time delays from interstellar communication. The name, and indeed the idea of the Ansible, was coined by Ursula K. Le Guin, no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I apologize. A fantasy and science fiction author known for The Left Hand of Darkness and A Wizard of Earthsea, who in 2016 had her work immortalized in the Library of America, an honor that's normally reserved for the likes of Mark Twain or Nathaniel Hawthorne. She created the Ansible for her 1966 novel, Rogue Hannon's World. Ansible is a contraction of the word answerable because one could use a device to answer someone over great distances. Within the Enderverse, Orson Scott Card, the author of Ender's Game, gives a somewhat scientific description of the Ansible. Ansible is the nickname for a philotic parallax instantaneous communicator. It's definitely a mouthful. First, I need to explain what a philote is. They're a non-mass particle that have only location. Philotes are the fundamental components of the universe. They are within each atom, each particle, each molecule, and ultimately, each sentient. Philots have distinct levels of intelligence depending on the type of entity they inhabit. The most intelligent ones inhabiting sentience. Those philots are properly called Eua. Again, no idea about the pronunciation. The Eua are also what gives life forms their sentience. Philots form connections with all other philots throughout the universe and are able to communicate with one another through what's called the philotic web. All of this is just to describe how the formic hive queen communicates telepathically. And that's how she communicates with all her worker drones as well. So the Ansible uses this exact same principle to do its FTL communication. There's a lot of science to sift through here. However, let's try and figure out how much of the science that powers the idea of an Ansible is true, or at least on the right track. In 1935, Albert Einstein, Boris Podolsky, and Nathan Rosen published a paper called Can Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete? In it, they came up with a thought experiment called the EPR Paradox which they used to try and argue that the description of physical reality given by wave functions, the Copenhagen interpretation, is not complete. These ideas laid the groundwork for what would become known as quantum entanglement. However, it wasn't until later when Erwin Schrödinger sent a letter to Einstein within which they used the term quantum entanglement to describe the correlations between two particles that interact and then separate as in the EPR experiment. The letter was in German, however Schrodinger later translated it to entanglement. Famously called spooky action at a distance by Einstein is what the technology behind the Ansible is based. I don't claim to be an expert on quantum physics, but two subatomic particles we linked or entangled where the sum of the individual characteristics from both particles will equal to zero. For example, if one has a spin of 0.5, the other will have a spin of negative 0.5, about the same axis. The entanglement between the two particles is extremely fragile, and the quantum system can easily collapse. This makes it very difficult to create any real-world technologies out of this quantum property. But when has a little difficulty ever really stopped humans? Recently, there has been considerable progress in quantum computing using quantum properties to increase processing speed in comparison with traditional computers. We are still some ways away from having a fully functioning Ansible like the one portrayed in the film, but still, even the thought of something like that can start going really fast. That's insanely cool. Perhaps even more exciting is the idea of a quantum teleportation. I won't go into that here, I also have a very limited understanding of that, but I posted a few links in the little doobly-doo at the bottom. If you're interested, take a look. I have made this a section because of the artificial gravity associated with the battle school. The film invokes two different types of artificial gravity. The rotating ring type artificial gravity, and then also a artificial gravity that's just created as if out of nowhere. Star Trek style, essentially. 
I searched and I searched and I could not find any info on the specs of the space station seen in the movie. In the book, the space station has nine battle rooms, not the one big ball you see on screen. But here I'll focus on what we see in the movie because that's what we have. There is a large habitation ring that circles around a central spindle connected to the main battle room. In this habitation ring, there is artificial gravity, generated, I'm assuming, from the rotation of the ring. As I discussed in this video, it is possible to generate viable artificial gravity from a rotating ring or cylinder, if the diameter is over a certain size. However, since I don't know the diameter of the habitation ring, I won't be getting into the details of if it works in the context of what is shown. The ring structure is employed as a method of artificial grav tech, but it is also shown that they can independently manipulate gravity through some sort of fanciful technology. For example, this device here, called a hook. In this scene, the hallway he is standing in has artificial gravity. Because that hallway is in the central spindle about which the hab ring rotates, it couldn't possibly be getting gravity from rotation. So we must assume, therefore, that the space station is using some form of artificial grav tech to keep Ender in place. Once Ender walks into the battle room, he simply floats away into zero G. So the grav tech has to be very localized around the floor of the hallway. They must have two forms of artificial gravity. But why do they use both at the battle school? Having to build a space station with the constraint of having a giant spinning ring attached to it really limits what you can do with your design. It doesn't exactly maximize livable space, for example. Let's assume that artificial gravity technology is really expensive, or at least uses a lot of energy. In that case, you would want to have a station that uses only grav ring technology and not artificial gravity technology. It'd be more efficient, both cost and energy wise. Again, in that case, it would make sense to have all the corridors leading to the battle room and such to be zero G. The cost of having them with artificial gravity would just outweigh the need, especially since the ring itself already has artificial gravity, so the living spaces are covered. On the other hand, if artificial gravity technology is extremely cheap or exceedingly energy efficient, then the whole station would be based off artificial grav tech because you could do a lot more with the actual design of the station, and you could make it much more interesting for the purpose of zero-g training. It just doesn't make sense as to why you'd have both technologies. I guess it looks cool in the movie though. Stepping off a ledge, falling into zero gravity, and floating away. Welcome to games and recreation. Cerebral control enabled. The whole field of brain machine interfaces is really starting to gain traction. It's an extremely exciting field, which as many fields is hugely interdisciplinary and requires teams of individuals from various backgrounds to make any measurable progress. In super duper layman's terms, what are brain machine interfaces? Well, essentially, they are exactly what the name suggests. In some form or another, they connect portions of the brain responsible for certain tasks with a machine analog that can carry out those tasks. This can be quite specific, such as hearing, or extremely broad, such as dream projection, and using your mind to drive a car. To explain it with more detail would take a considerable amount of time and a scary amount of research, so I'll get into the nitty gritty of it all in another video. However, for those of you who want to know more now, you should definitely check out this article at Wait But Why. Tim Urban is a fantastic writer who makes complicated subjects super entertaining and easy to read. Although still quite a young field, there are already a few technologies that, while limited in scope, have had huge impacts in people's lives. A well-known example, cochlear implants. If you don't know what those are, check this out. Another more recent development, and again, excuse my pronunciation, is a woman named Almerina Mascarello, who, as part of a scientific project, was given a bionic hand that had sensory feedback in the form of pressure perception. She could actually feel if what she was picking up with the bionic hand was soft or hard. And all of this was controlled by her brain, using the same networks we would normally use to move a bionic hand, only now repurposed to move this lady's bionic hand. The end goal with brain-machine interfaces is to be able to connect yourself to a computer and upload your consciousness, retaining what makes you you, but being able to take advantage of all the benefits provided by digital processing. This... This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? 
If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Anyways, back to Ender's Game. There are several instances of brain-machine interfaces in the film. Obviously, they don't go into any depth on how they function. But we can make some inferences about them based on what is shown. The first thing we see is the monitor. A brain implant that allows the IF officials to see and hear everything the students do. This technology uses electrodes wired into specific parts of the brain to allow this kind of access. Think cochlear implant and retinal implant. Both very real technologies that we use today, just the two mixed together essentially. And then hooked up to a receiving end to watch it on a screen. Later we see Ender playing the mind game. The game works like, well, here, she can explain it. The game is a thought relationship between the child and the computer. Together they create stories. Then change the story. The stories reflect the child's emotional reality. I can't change that. I don't know how these images got into the game. So there's a relationship between the device and the user's thoughts, creating a story based on the user's emotional reality. I'm not sure how the device is connected to the user. Maybe it's through electrodes embedded in the handholds of the device, unlikely. Or maybe it's simply reading the electromagnetic radiation coming off of the user. Or it's using the phyllotes and the AUA that I mentioned earlier. That last one is probably the case, which is unfortunate because it doesn't really have much of an analog to our own universe. However, either way, the user's mind is directly linked to the device and has full, dexterous control of what occurs in the game. Further on in the film, Ender uses the big battle simulator. Here he has to use hand motions and gestures to control the screen, whereas in the mind game he simply had to think it and the mouse would do it, the mouse being the actual little mouse creature. Maybe there's a difference between the two because the battle simulator is controlling actual ships and the mind game isn't and this is virtual. Actually, I'm not really sure Ender is controlling the ships to be honest, all his cronies seem to be controlling the actual ships, he's just orchestrating the whole thing and being super stressed about it. There probably is some stupid reason that there's a difference between the two interfaces. I mean, so far the film's science of things hasn't been very logical. How do these representations, however disjointed, stack up to what we aim to do in reality? Well, fairly well I'd say. I mean, if you look at motion and gesture recognition, we already have quite a few technologies that can do that. Then there are the actual brain-machine interfaces. Let's just focus on the mind game. Quick answer, yes, we can almost have something set up like that now. Granted, we still need some form of physical communication from the head or brain to the device, but being able to control a game with your brain is already a thing. What we lack is the dexterity and fidelity that we see in the film. A truly impressive company that is making some amazing steps in this field is Neurable. We use a small wearable called an EEG or electroencephalography. It's just a small cap or headset that you wear that records your brain activity and then it gets sent to the computer. That's crazy, right? And that is without actually interpreting the direct signals from the brain of what the user is thinking. That's just using brain activity to make inferences and then draw conclusions. I use the word just as if it's just some simple thing. Imagine what we'll be able to do with computers when we're fully plugged in. A lot more than what Ender is able to do in the film. I like this scene in the house. Despite the rest of the film not being the best scientifically, they do a great job of portraying what a near future normal life would be like. Like this little hydroponic system. Or this window slash TV slash phone slash doorbell. The integrated tech with traditional housing that we are already used to is where I think things are headed and they portray that really well. This looks awesome, but I feel like those solar panels would take quite the beating when the rocket launches. Also, they would constantly be getting covered in dust when the launches, so I don't know how viable it actually is. I appreciate that they don't use some whimsical technology for getting us into orbit. Humanity will be using some form of combustion-based rockets for some time still to get to orbit. Reusable rockets will be leading the way in leaving and returning to Earth. That's a nice smooth landing. How is it that none of the Formic drones notice the burning jet kamikazeing into the Queen's ship? Also, are there ships made of dry spaghetti? Why do they shatter like that? And what's with all the cheering? They have seen this clip like hundreds of times. Oh my god, I would love to have a battle in Zero-G room like that. It'd be so cool, it'd be so much fun. These guys are still trying to stay up the way they came in. They look like they're just kind of floating around, willy-nilly. These would float really far away, really fast, and they're tiny. This one seems cool, but 
wouldn't he still maintain his rotational momentum and keep spinning even after he pushed off? Yeah, yeah. He definitely would keep slowly flipping head over heels. It would be so hard to get the timing right of when to pull and how long to make the rope in order to have him come back and into the gate and not slam into the wall in the process. Once we have robots and AI capable of doing this type of surgery, it will greatly improve the success rate. Again, I like that they acknowledge that in the near future, robots will be better suited to that type of task. Gorgeous. We'll take off and landing. <laughs> SpaceX. To what animals the Formix most often compared? Ants. Which have? A queen. Who directs the worker ants? What she thinks they do. Without her, they can't think for themselves. And they die. What? Okay, fine. They are hive minded. You kill the queen bee or the queen ant, and maybe the colony goes into disarray or gets confused. But all the ants have just die. Not instantly, at least. Some eventually they do, but. Why do all the drones die? It doesn't make any sense. Just because you kill the queen doesn't mean every single drone just drops to the sky and dies. Where are they getting these visuals? If that asteroid field is as dense as they make it look, it shouldn't be, then there's no way they can look right through it. How, how are they getting these images? Didn't the whole fleet just get destroyed? How does make sense? It would all be a big ball of disassociated atoms, so the surface would be relatively smooth and hot. Well, that's about it for today. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you really enjoyed the video. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe and more videos will be on the way, but like I said before, I'm still in university so it might be a while for the next one, but stay tuned and every now and then I will be posting more videos to come. Uh, those of you who watched the previous videos and stuck around and managed to watch this video as well, thank you very much, my 10 dedicated subscribers, awesome. Well, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time on Factor Film.